Hello and welcome back. I'm Steve Clemens, editor at large of The Hill. Thanks for joining us for round two of Reset 2021, the new American start. Our look at key policy initiatives we can expect in the Biden administration of the next 100 days and beyond. Earlier in today's program, we put the spotlight on economic recovery and infrastructure revitalization. For the next hour, we're going to discuss immigration and the environment and anything else my uh, guests want to talk about. This is a time for big ideas. We're going to look at the first 100 days of the Biden administration and how is environmental sustainability being prioritized and what actions we might expect on the immigration front. Before we get answers to those questions, a few housekeeping notes. Please tweet us at The Hill Events using the hashtag The Hill Reset. Not too many characters in there, so it should be easy. We're broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions throughout the program. As with any live stream, you could experience occasional trouble. Don't throw your computer out. Just push refresh and it should fix the problem. My first guest is Congressman Ted Deutsch from Florida. He's a co-founder of the Climate Solutions Caucus. He's also chair of the House Ethics Committee. Congressman Deutsch, I'm surprised you don't have a crown on right now. <laughs> People wonder what you're talking about. And I do. I know. Do this is a little out of context, committee. but we're having fun today. So I need to out us. You know, Congressman Ted Deutsch helps raise half a million dollars a year for children in the arts here in the greater Washington area. Area. Uh, in, in something called Will on the Hill. And, and, and the Hill is a part of that. I'm a part of that. Ted Deutsch is a part of it. And you are fantastic. So I just want to say, the, and we wear really ridiculous um, outfits. So I hope that was okay, Congressman. Uh, no, 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 thanks. I do uh, usually opt for a crown of some sort. Your headgear always seems to have a bell on it. I don't know what that says about you, Steve. <laughs> well, anyway, Congressman, it's great to see you. You know, as we talk about reset sure. and big ideas, um, you know, some of the thing is what's practical, what's doable. You know, you've been part of the Climate Solutions Caucus trying to think about now President Biden is in uh, moving the needle on, at least on executive orders on some issues related to climate. Um, so what do you think is doable and what do you think are the bigger ideas that we should be aspiring to in this time? Uh, well, thanks. Look, I, first of all, let's not brush over the significance of the things that the administration did on its own, starting with the uh, executive order to rejoin the, the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, we, we were absent for four years. Uh, the decision to move forward sends a, a clear signal to the rest of the world that, that we are recommitting ourselves to, to this battle, um, that this is something that impacts the entire world. It affects our economy. It affects the safety of our planet, our national security. So that was a, that was a really big deal that, that uh, the Biden administration did on its own. Um, canceling the permit for Keystone, I, again, I think is, is something that, uh, that sends a signal about how we're approaching uh, dealing with carbon and that leads, and then there are lots of other executive orders, but that leads to your question and the, the big things. I, I've, um, I've maintained that anything we do, and I think people acknowledge this, has to be bipartisan. Certainly if we're gonna do a big climate related uh, bill, something that's gonna really address climate change and change the behavior of polluters, and a carbon fee, I think, is the best way to do that, which is why uh, our legislation, uh, Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, um, was introduced. And it's why I continue to believe, as the Biden team formulates what it should do going forward, that any piece of it is going to have to change behavior. And if we could change behavior by imposing a fee and then return all of the revenue back to uh, American households, that's a, a win-win, and it, it's a good approach. Congressman, I, you know, I want to double down on this because I want our lay people who may not follow these to understand what you're talking by, by way of your legislation and this carbon fee and returning to yeah. households. Can you explain it a little bit, a little bit further? Sure. The whole idea here, Steve, is that polluters ought to pay. They should pay for the the carbon they put into uh, into the atmosphere, and so we've uh, we've moved legislation forward, bipartisan legislation. That, that puts a, a fee, of 50, initially $15 per ton on carbon mm -hmm. emissions. That increases each year that, with the idea that it's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by changing the, again, changing the behavior of the polluters. And then 100% of the revenue that's generated by the fee is going to return uh, via a monthly check. So this, I think this was a good approach before, but in light of the challenges that, <clears throat> that, that we faced as a result of the pandemic, it makes even more sense now that we're talking about uh, really significant returns back to uh, back to to every household, and that's um, that's 
uh, again, that's the way that we can both change the way that polluters behave. Uh, it's going to reduce carbon output. It's going to reduce arbit, carbon output by uh, close to 40% by 2030, just doing this alone. That'll exceed our Paris commitments and an annual dividend of over $1,400 for each eligible adult uh, by the time it's fully implemented. So that's what we're trying to do. And, and um, again, we think, and the analysis bears this out, that this would help protect public health and it will contribute to public welfare. You know, for a lot of you listening, this has a lot of the dimensions of the Alaska Permanent Fund, you know, taking, you know, taking a, a common good or asset, distributing out uh, returns to, to the broad public as they do in Alaska with uh, 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 oil and gas revenue, which they distribute. Um, I used to be at the New America Foundation. Ted Halstead was kicking around with this. What I find interesting about this subject is that there are a lot of conservatives that support it. I mean, so what do you think the, the possibility of getting uh, a lot of bipartisan support on this, on this initiative uh, might be? Well, there is, there's a, a range, uh, a pretty broad range of supporters, uh, environmental groups and business groups uh, who recognize that we need to do something and also acknowledge that this is the right way to do it. Uh, and Steve, I come from South Florida and down here, climate change, sea level rise being the, the one thing that we see all the time, it's not, that's not a partisan issue. And so the county elected officials, the local elected officials have all come together in South Florida to deal with this issue in Congress. Uh, we need to bring people together also because the challenges of climate change aren't limited, again, to any one part of the country, red or blue. We've seen the impact on, on the severity of storms, the, the, uh, the fires, the dangers that it poses to our, our now, the risks that it poses to our national security. Um, and we've seen this literally flooding literally every part of the country. So um, it, is, it is bipartisan and because there's support again, from both environmental groups and business groups, uh, we think that with, with their help, we might be able to push other members who otherwise might not take this up as a big priority uh, to do that. And because President Biden is committed to doing something, so uh, we should be working toward achieving that goal because we're moving forward one way or another. Well, your point was well made because we had uh, Francis Suarez, the mayor of Miami, on just before you just a few minutes ago. Making, I asked him, tell me the one thing you would tell Joe Biden if you were able to talk to him right now. And he says, climate, 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 you know, look, you know, look, at, look at these issues, look at, you know, a serious set of initiatives around that. So, uh, and, and Francis, um, I think, is still a Republican. Well, you know, I'm not quite sure, but I think, you know, that, that tells the story a little bit. But let me ask you, you know, something a little bit more um, uh, on this to you know, make it a little bit more controversial. So sure. you've got John Kerry out now as our climate envoy. And, you know, we're back in the Paris Climate Accords. There's a lot of coordination. And, you know, China, as best I can tell, also has been supportive of moving along this way. But there's, there, there is a kind of tension out there on the global front of technologies in this area. You know, China has invested a huge amount in solar cells, in batteries. When you look at the infrastructure of, you know, our future energy platforms that would be greener, you look at also the mathematical equation of how we achieve the climate targets we have, it's hard to imagine hitting them without nuclear. What are the uncomfortable trade-offs that you think are still out there on the climate front? It's not all gonna be solar. So if it's not all gonna be solar, what do we need to do by carbon sequestration, by way of nuclear, by way of actually subsidizing much more industrial policy to produce you know, the kind of batteries and energy grid and conservation uh, framing that we need? Uh, right, well, we need to recognize, and, and you started to touch on this, that this is, yes, this is about uh, fighting climate change. It's about saving the planet. It's about doing the things that will help save the economies like mine down here in South Florida, where where sea level rise and, and the increasing number and severity of hurricanes is, uh, is really a, an ongoing threat to our state and our economy. Yes, we have to recognize that, but it also offers a tremendous opportunity, an economic opportunity, uh, if we seize it. And that means, uh, that means looking at all of the new technologies and, uh, and identifying where we can be global leaders. And we shouldn't shy away from the fight. You've seen great advances, uh, especially on uh, battery technology and um, uh, in our own country, you've seen other advances uh, we need to continue to make investments in that. And then in terms of what should be on the table, how do we achieve this? How do we get to, um, uh, to, to net zero? 
Well, look, the it's it's a big deal that the announcement that that um, and the recognition that the automotive industry is moving to net zero is going to be significant. Uh, is going to require technological change. The fact that in, in the private sector. Larry Fink and the, the largest asset manager BlackRock in the world in his letter to CEO said you need to you need to actually start taking sustainability seriously and reporting on it um, that's a key piece and then the types of technologies that we look at I think need to be varied and expansive we can't we can't start taking things off the table altogether not if the goal is to arrive at a big comprehensive bipartisan bill that will allow us to, to dramatically move forward. This, we don't have time to waste. Uh, and, and I don't want to push people away from the table. Uh, I want anyone who's serious about this at the table uh, to have a conversation about the economy, about climate change, about technology and innovation, uh, and about all of the ways that we can accomplish this. Ted, Ted, real quick before we go, you know, I, sure. I, I always try to think of myself, okay, let's transport ourselves four years from now. You know, we've seen four years of work from the Biden team. What does your gut tell you right now? You know, do, you have a, do you have a sense whether this big stuff we're talking about, this inflection point is going to matter, that we're going to be proud of ourselves in four years, or are you worried? Uh, well, I, I'm only a few weeks. We're all only a few weeks away from January 6th. So let's yeah. acknowledge that. And, and the ongoing challenge to democracy in, in our country and around the world is real, and we've got to confront it. But on climate, um, because, it, look, go back for a second, Steve, and think about uh, what happened when, when President Trump withdrew from the climate accords. You had mayors, you right. had business leaders, CEOs, uh, you had local state officials all around the country stepping up and saying, this is too important. We're going to do our part uh, to make sure that the U.S. meets its obligations. Well, now that's continued. You have an administration that's willing to partner with state and local government and the private sector on this issue. So I am hopeful that when we look ahead four years, so many of the changes have already started without the leadership mm -hmm. and, and buy-in at the highest levels of government. Now you're going to add that layer to it and that leadership. Uh, and I, I think we're finally going to make the progress that's urgently needed. Well, listen, Congressman Ted Deutsch, co-founder of the Climate Solutions Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your conversations. I look forward to seeing you on the stage again soon and really appreciate your candor about climate today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Good to be with you. My next guest is Mayor Todd Gloria of America's largest border city, San Diego, where I've spent a lot of time. I want to tell him that up front. Uh, he's been out there. You know, he's been elected mayor in December, became the first person of color, the first openly gay mayor in the city's history. We're excited he's here with us today. Great to see you, Mayor. Thank you. Are you having fun yet? Oh, I'm having a blast. Uh and I'm glad to hear you're a fan of our city. It shows you have incredibly good taste. Oh, I've been, I've, been, I've been in your city. I know more about your city. I mean, and, and San Diego's an incredible story of change and transition. And, you know, when I think about, like, you've got Qualcomm down there, UCSD, San Diego State, you know, all of these great things. And, you know, when you talk, I had Mayor Suarez on a little bit a while ago. And, you know, without, without knocking any city, I love all cities, all, all of them equally. But uh, when you go back 20, 30 years um, San Diego had a lot of that flatness and the absence of kind of headquarters as Miami had. Francis Suarez was just talking about how that's dramatically changed. You know, San Diego's had those big changes. So as you look at, you know, going from, you know, uh, uh, what, what my friend Mick Cornett in, of Oklahoma City would say, you know, a really great mid-tier city to a great global city, what are the key parts, what's on your dashboard that, that, that you need to make happen? Yeah, I love that question. So you're giving me chills because <laughs> you're exactly right. I think my election uh, hopefully is representative of a different kind of San Diego, right? We are the eighth largest city in the country, and we're going to start acting now. Uh, and to your, uh, to your question, you know, there is so much hope and opportunity in the reset presented by the Biden-Harris administration, not just on the financial side, and I think you well know cities are hurting because of the pandemic, and we need federal partnership to address that to keep frontline workers uh, in their jobs, but the sort of expansive portfolio that's now possible. In the last four years, so many things were just not even on the table. And whether it's an issue I'm passionate about around immigration reform and really uh, doing right by the hundreds of thousands of San Diegans for whom this is a personal issue, uh, to the conversation we're having just a moment ago of climate action. San Diego was 
uh, when it adopted its uh, climate action plan in 2015, was the largest city in the country to commit to running 100% renewable energy. We did that at a time that we were losing federal partnership. Now to be able to advance that goal with federal leadership is going to be transformative. You know, well, let me ask you a question. I mean, um, so I, I have known San Diego for decades. You know, we had the maquiladoras across the border. You had a lot of awareness of the, 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 the Tijuana-San Diego border. And whether there was Republican leadership or Democratic leadership in San Diego, everybody was aware of this important of binationality, of immigration, of free flow, of trade. You know, things like NAFTA were good. What do you think kept that spirit of understanding of dynamic immigration and a multi-ethnic uh, uh, city by cities from taking hold elsewhere in the country. I was always intrigued that I could find incredible conservative leaders in San Diego that seemed so enlightened, but I didn't see that uh, replicated elsewhere in the United States at that time. Well, all things are local, right? And that uh, was really born out of necessity. We see ourselves as two cities, two nations, but really one community, one family. Uh, and for San Diegans, crossing the border is not a novelty. It's what they do to go to work or uh, to see family. And so that just sort of breeds the need to be bicultural, binational, uh, and to work in a cooperative fashion. You say in a nonpartisan way, you know, Steve, if I may, though, that, that works at the local level. But of course, as you saw, uh, one of my predecessors ascend to national politics, uh, thinking of Pete Wilson, his orientation on this issue changed dramatically. Uh, right. And I think, again, that's the difference that this new administration can bring to bear. Uh, we know Joe Biden's heart on this issue on immigration and on uh, international cooperation will support San Diego uh, and our, our, the needs of our community. Uh, so um, it is, uh, again, it's, it is a hyper-local focus to have that kind of cooperation. It's just important to have partnership at the federal level because much of that binational relationship depends on federal partnership. We're trying to build an additional port of entry here in San Diego that would uh, make it easier for folks to cross. So quite a contrast between the wall that has been advanced over the last four years. Uh, but those permits are often required by national uh, government. They require international treaties with our partners in Mexico. And having a Biden administration as a partner in that effort would make it much more likely that San Diegans will quit having to sit in traffic for hours on end trying to cross back and forth. But instead, we have the free flow of people and goods, uh, not only supporting our citizenry, but also supporting our economy. Look, I was on the, one of the calls that Jake Sullivan, the president's national security advisor, and Susan Rice's domestic policy advisors and others gave about some of the steps they were going to take on the border, immigration policy reform, uh, you know, people you know, looking for asylum in the country. And, and one of the messages they shared is this is going to take time, that we're going to try to immediately be much more humane. But those people thinking that Joe Biden is an easy path into America, they got to understand that's not, that's not right. And, and, and Jake Sullivan in particular really underscored that. But but in talking about, you know, ending the Muslim ban, you know, creating, uh, you know, reform on immigration, which was very important, them changing uh, and, and reinforcing this, the status of DACA. What are the elements of immigration reform that you think are vital, that are right at the top of the list? Well, I, the, what the president has been able to do through executive order already is really important. Uh, stopping the construction of the wall here in our backyard uh, goes a long way to focusing the dollars that we need on that new port of entry, on cleaning up the Tijuana River Valley, some of the issues that are much more uh, pertinent to the everyday lives of San Diego uh, or someone living in Tijuana. Uh, beyond that, the, the, the action on DACA, the Indian, the Muslim ban, these are all things that we support here in San Diego because the, uh, we have a welcoming communities uh, initiative uh, that really speaks to all those things. Going beyond that, we need partnership with Congress to pass immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform, uh, things that would do uh, have offering a path to, to citizenship, uh, something that expedites and reforms the process. We know many people are stuck in a bureaucratic nightmare of who those who are trying to follow the legal process, which is just not functional. Um, you know, here in San Diego, you know, we're a proud military town. The fact that we deport some of our uh, veterans, people who've served this nation in uniform, but who may not have the benefits of citizenship and who can thereby be deported, that is something that happens with great frequency because of our military concentration as well as our position on the border. Something like that should enjoy bipartisan support. As I mentioned a moment ago, I think we all know Joe Biden's heart on this issue. The question is, does Congress have the heart to take action? And I'll tell you that we have been waiting the last four years 
but we are content to do uh, the time that is necessary to get this right, to have this become actual law, not executive order, because the people who are living with the consequences of, of dysfunction on immigration is impacting their day-to-day -day life. Mayor, you're an LGBT leader. Um, I know this space well as, as well. You know, you're out there in the forefront. You've got a lot of people there. As you said, you've got a lot of military veterans, families. The Joe Biden has just um, um, basically removed any restrictions to transgendered service in the military. I just want to take the temperature of, of this. Is this a non-issue now in San Diego? Or, you know, people celebrate, hey, we've got a gay mayor. Uh, or are, are there people that say, you know, that, 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 that this is still something where we need to work on still uh, bridging um, that level of understanding and understanding and connecting that to other forms of civic justice and, and embrace of diversity and inclusion? Uh, well, you know, we've come a long way. I think uh, to back to San Diego's Harvey Milk, a woman named Christine Kehoe, who was elected here in San Diego about 25 years ago. Um, and so there has been now, you know, a couple decades of LGBT representation in office here in San Diego. And, and uh, it has made it less of a thing, but Steve, it's still very much a thing. You know, when I was in high school, I had a teacher tell me that you could not be an elected official if you were openly gay. Uh, and here I am today. Uh, I'm representative of progress, but I really recognize the fact that whether it's LGBTQ youth or the children of color of this city who have never seen anyone that looks quite like them in the mayor's office, uh, and think about the context, Steve. I'm here on the U.S.-Mexican border. I'm here on the Pacific Rim. It has taken over 150 years for this city to elect a person of color, let alone an LGBTQ person, to the highest office in the city. We still have a lot of work to do. And much like our vice president, I'm committed to being the first, but not the last. Well, Todd Gloria, mayor of San Diego, I'm really, really happy to talk to you. I hope you'll come back many more times. Uh, I'm obsessed with your city, Nola, and I'm very, very happy that you are in that place and that you are out there helping to make uh, these broader justice um, issues work. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Look forward to having you in San Diego again soon. Absolutely. My next guest is Gregory Whetstone, the president and CEO of the American Council on Renewable Energy. He previously served as senior counsel in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Gregory Whetstone, great to see you. Thank you. I've been hearing about ACOR forever. You know, in the 1990s, I worked for Senator Jeff Bingaman, and I knew a lot of his ongoing areas. And, you know, you knew him like I did, and he uh, was obsessed with this area. And he really embraced, he says, you know, we need to, we need to put the things in place. This is not going to happen on its own. And, and you have a subsidized fossil you know, fuel industry, and we didn't have the things here. But let, let me just ask you, you know, how is it going? Uh, is, is gravity moving the right direction to get us towards a renewable ener energy infrastructure in this nation? Tell us where we are. Uh, happy to do that. Thanks for having me on. Let me just say, uh, Jeff Bingaman, that, that's a great pedigree. And, and you know, a, a lot of where we are is a result of vision of people like uh, Senator Bingaman, who used to, as you know, chair the Senate Energy Committee, uh, the vision he had has been realized, and we're very fortunate that it's been realized really without the benefit of some of the big picture federal policies that I think we might have anticipated uh, to address the climate crisis. Uh, we don't have those policies yet, but the renewable sector has been growing hand over fist last year in 2020, despite the pandemic, despite four years of pretty much headwinds from the Trump administration, we've been able to grow at a record level in 2020, over 28,500 megawatts of new wind and solar capacity, broke the record from 2016, which was more like 23,000 megawatts, uh, 50 to $60 billion in investment a year, uh, costs decreasing on a regular basis is one big reason for the growth. Another reason, more demand, not just from residential consumers, but companies going out buying their own power. And of course, you've got states, 15 states actually, with 100% renewable energy uh, targets by a date certain here in D.C., uh, 2032 is a deadline. That's the most aggressive in the whole country. And now we have, obviously, the dawn of a very supportive administration. So we're, we're fortunate to be in a position where we can play the role we're going to need to play 
to deal with the climate issue, but that's going to require significantly more growth still. Gregory, I ask this kind of semi-facetiously. Is there any connection between the windmills behind you and cancer? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, <laughs> there is not. And, and you know, it, and it, it, it's kind of a sad sign of the times. Uh, the, the joke is even there to be made. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, we're generating is, uh, energy, powering American economic growth with zero pollution uh, and uh, zero fuel costs. We're free. You know, we're it's American fuel, our wind, our sun. We don't have to pay for it. And uh, there's no reason we shouldn't be doing more of it. And, and the technology is available yeah. now to do what we need to do to address climate and create investment and economic growth jobs all at the same time. Look, I always hesitate name dropping, but it is D.C. But I, I mean, two of my other favorite people in the area that you work on are Ernie Moniz, the former secretary of energy, but Absolutely. also Arun, Arun Majumdar, who was the founding uh, head of ARPA-E, the Advanced Re Research Project Agency that was looking at a lot of the, you know, the gaps in kind of renewable energy or next gen generation batteries and whatnot. I guess my question to you, when, you, when I would get together with Ernie Muniz and he would go through and, you know, mesmerize an audience with not only all of the incredible technological revolutions that were happening in the energy space, but the staggering change in the cost price. And, and so I guess with those two things, with, with, with technology jumping forward so much, you know, even in wind, even in, 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 in solar, which there but a broad array of things that we need in the grid and other elements, but also the way in which the, the competitiveness of these industries with others there. Can you give our audience, can you break that out for a little bit for people so that we don't just say it in these big terms, so people get an understanding of how real the chance is that a transition is possible? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be clear, the technology is here. It's really about figuring out ways to get it deployed. Uh, wind and solar power have become so much less expensive over the past decade that in most of the country today, renewable power is the cheapest source of new electricity. Just to be specific, the cost of wind power has been reduced by 70% over the last 10 years, and the cost of solar power has been reduced by 90%. And those are rock solid figures. Happy to share the PowerPoint to any of your viewers, listeners who uh, want more data there. We've, we've got it. Uh, and this is very real. And that's one reason why we see so much more demand because it's cost effective. And you don't have to worry that there's gonna be a you know, global volatility in prices and your price is going to go up in five years. You know exactly what your prices are going to be. Gregory, um, last question. Uh, J Joe Manchin is, is now uh, chairman of the Senate Energy and Public Works Committee, and John Barrasso is the ranking member. So Wyoming, West Virginia, right? They have certain kind of profiles that are less in the space of renewables than some other parts of the country. And, and Senator Manchin has said that, look, he's for all of the above. He wants to work with all of these. He wants to get investment uh, in renewables and broader deployment in the country. But we also have to look about displaced workers and the systemic impacts of transition. Do, I, I know it's not your responsibility to do that, but I'm wondering if you've seen any progress, any smart um, angles on how a state like West Virginia, state less dense like Wyoming, can begin thinking about you know, bringing into the state some of these alternative energy possibilities that are linked to, you know, economic vitality for people and, and, and their incomes? Yeah, that's a really important question today. And we're, we're very focused on it. Those, those opportunities are clearly there. We have renewable energy jobs in every state of the country. Uh, Wyoming, uh, you know, Senator Brasso's state is a... Uh, just a gold mine of wind energy resources, and they're working on building out transmission. They're going to be exporting, you know, pollution-free wind power and uh, generating a lot of income for the state in the process. Uh, all kinds of opportunities in West Virginia as well. And I, I want to say, you know, we we're in the renewable sector providing opportunities for economic growth, particularly in rural areas across the country where you don't have a lot of other potential growth 
uh, drivers on anywhere near the same scale. And we can make a difference economically, you know, in the heart of coal country, give those folks a place to go. And, and the coal sector, it's not just renewables. It's also uh, natural gas, a variety of reasons. Those jobs are going away, and uh, we need to be part of the transition to a better future. And one, our economy can be booming and, and will be booming without contributing to the climate crisis, in fact, addressing it. And at the same time, we'll be providing more pristine air quality across the country uh, and, and improving uh, health. So that's the place we want to be. Well, Gregory Wetzone, President and CEO of the American Council on Renewable Energy, this was fun. I really enjoyed our talk. Love to have you back. Be a pleasure, Steve. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, I'll look forward to next time. All right, my friend. Thank you. My next guest is Nadia Nazar. She is co-founder and co-executive director of Zero Hour, a youth-led climate organization. But let me, before you say anything, let me just read a little bit about you here. This is crazy. People Magazine named Nadia as one of 2018 top 25 women changing the world. Uh, she is, is, spoke at the UN headquarters about the impact of climate crisis. You know, she's one of the people that helped lead the March 15th DC climate strike, September 20th. DC. I feel like this, this context is important. I mean, you're a, you're a change agent. You're out there. We're talking about a reset. We're talking about the environment. So I want you to tell us what is most important that, that this policy town needs to hear. And great yeah, to see you. I'm really glad that Trump is out of office now because not only was he not doing anything on climate, but he was actually making things worse by, by taking away environmental regulations that were already there and pulling out of so many things. And I'm glad that Biden has canceled the Keystone XL pipeline. But I'm still a bit weary of Biden, even though he's still doing some things here and there. I feel like a lot of it is somewhat like performative, especially with like signing back on the Paris Agreement, um, because the Paris Agreement doesn't really hold us to, to certain standards to get to a point that we need to be to take action to help people that are being disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. And so, so, you, so you're still worried. You're, he, you're still you're still worried about the team that's come in. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think that it's it's better than before, but we need to have more action and we need to implement things like a Green New Deal and the things under the Green New Deal resolution. What do you think if you were to say the top thing? You know, I've I've read the. Most of the Green New Deal, you know, it's coming, it's, it's been, you know, become a tug of war over it in so many different directions. I'm not sure what shape it is in, in right now as far as a concept. But what do you think the two or three most important elements of it are to your generation and to your advocates, those, those people that led uh, uh, the, the climate strikes? I mean, I remember the climate strikes, you know, here in Europe, around the world. Um, what are the elements that you think are most important for our audience to know? Yeah, definitely the main elements are just transition to renewable energy, making sure that people get jobs and fossil fuel workers are able to get jobs in renewable energy, as well as public transportation, um, proper animal agriculture. And I think a lot of it is just mainly curbing how corporations have exploited our land from fossil fuel corporations to animal agriculture corporations, the fast fashion industry. There are so many industries that are constantly running and even in this pandemic constantly taking more and more resources from our land and, and the way the planet works. You know, when when uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez was mocked uh, for certain elements of that, you know, particularly as you talk about the agricultural element, you know, talking about cows, talking whatever, but it was a way to kind of minimize a discussion about how many, much of our resources, how many of our resources in this country are going to, to eat meat or eat beef. Or as you talk about the fashion industry, you know, something I had not known is how much water is involved in clothes production. It, it made me realize there's so much I'm ignorant of about that. I think most Americans are. What do you think, Nadia, can be done to sort of elevate those so that people have a greater recognition of what a pair of jeans, you know, require by way of water. What a, you know, a year of, of hamburgers um, means by way of environmental impact. Yeah, I think there's so much that someone can do individually to curb their, their carbon footprint and how much they're doing. But at the end of the day, I think that we all need to educate ourselves on how corporations are taking so much energy, taking all this water, taking all these resources, 
and and it's going to profit and not to people. And we need to hold those corporations accountable and hold our government accountable in order to hold those corporations accountable. And I think there's so much you can do, especially with like eating less meat and, and thrifting and so many things people can do individually. But at the end of the day, if the corporations don't stop constantly consuming and consuming and exploiting, really, then it's not going to change as much. Nadia, you spoke at the United Nations about the climate crisis um, impact on girls. Um, what is the impact on girls? What's that connection that we should know about? Yeah, the climate crisis, uh, the way that I see it, is intersected with so many different systems of oppression, including racism, patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, and more. And patriarchy is one of those main things, especially in certain like places in the world where, where girls don't have access to proper education, um, proper rights and everything. When you have natural disasters come in, those who have access to shelters, who have access to food and water and education are going to be prioritized and have the privilege to survive those disasters and not only survive, but be able to thrive afterwards where many girls will have to work on survival for their families rather than focusing on education and pursuing what they want to can you can you tell us just a little, I mean, you're in school right now, right? Yeah, you're, you're in school and you're doing all of this stuff. So you're you're a yeah. student activist. I'm a freshman okay. In yeah, yeah, you're still freshman in college. So so how does zero hour work? Yeah, it's mainly all online. It's always been kind of online because we're all kind of scattered throughout the country. And we normally um, would come together to organize something like once or twice a year. But we haven't been able to this past year. But since we've been organizing online for, for years, it hasn't been that hard to switch to online, but there is that the sense of like Zoom fatigue. Um, but it's really nice working with so many young people from across the country. And do you feel like you're being heard? Do you feel like you're having the impact you want to have? Not necessarily. I think in, in some parts, a lot of people are really learning. And a lot of what Zero Hour does is teaches young people about climate justice and, and what we can do, what we have to do. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's hard to, to hold our leaders accountable when they don't really want to listen. You know, I imagine at one point you're going to be in a room with President Biden. What's the one thing you're going to tell him? I would tell him that I'm disappointed and then I would ask for what we need. But I don't really expect him to take much with me. Well, with that, I really appreciate you coming and joining us today. I know you've got a busy schedule and you're doing a lot, but I want to hear your voice. I hope you'll come back. Nadia Nazar, co-founder and co-executive director and art director of Zero Hour, done a lot of cool stuff. And thank you so much for, for sharing your perspective with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And now I'm pleased to welcome a good friend who I've often called on. She probably is getting sick of appearing on my shows, but I just love hearing from her. Janet Mejia, president and CEO of Unidos US, the nation's largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization. She's been named among Hispanic Business Magazine's top 100 Latinas and 100 most influential Hispanics. I'd say the top 10 most influential Hispanics. Was named among the 100 most powerful women in Washington by Washingtonian Magazine. And Lorella uh, Pray Ali, the co-president co of Community Change and Community Change Action. She's previously served as the ACLU's deputy national political director and as Hillary Clinton's national Latino vote director. I really appreciate you both joining us. So, Janet, good to see you both. Good to see both of you. Janet and I are like old pals now. Uh, eventually, we're going to meet in person. I talk to I feel like I talk to you every month now online. But, Janet, let me ask you. We've got I a new we're, we're at an inflection point, right? We're an inflection point politically. You know, uh, uh, President Biden is now in there. He's working on these issues. Where uh, where do you want him to go to get the picture right? Where are you concerned that he could go wrong? Sure. Thanks, Steve. It's great to see you. By the way, happy Kansas Day. You know, this is uh, <laughs> exactly. Kansas's 160th birthday. So we're both Kansans. In Kansas that's right. That's right. You've got a good memory. But anyhow, look, I think uh, we're very excited about the prospect of the Biden-Harris administration yeah. taking on some very important issues. For us, the recovery of COVID, investing in relief, is incredibly important. And we know that Latinos and immigrants have been essential workers in this uh, most uh, critical crisis that we've had in a century. So for us, we see the opportunity to respond to COVID-19, to the pandemic, and to uh, make sure that we are including Latinos and immigrants in that response 
And with that, we're looking at the lens of essential workers. Uh, these individuals have stepped up and put their lives on the line uh, to keep America going. And we think there's going to be very good opportunities for us to move forward with protections as well as investments for these essential workers, whether they be dreamers, TPS holders, uh, the uh, farm workers, and any cohort of essential workers that have stepped up in this moment. So I think we can say that we've been very encouraged by the executive orders that President uh, Biden put in place on day one, and with the introduction of a comprehensive immigration reform plan and proposal on day one as well. It's a very bold uh, proposal that uh, addresses many of the issues that we have long fought for in terms of finally providing a sane, humane, and functional immigration system. That's great. Um, powerful. Lorella, let me ask you the same question, but in it, because I know you work with so many immigrant, immigrant groups that are often left out of the equation, that are preyed upon. You know, and part of the discussion we really haven't heard very much about, you know, and I don't know if I'm, you know, uh, articulating this correctly, but but there was a sort of siege, if you will, of sanctuary cities, of these places that, you know, like in Chicago and others were welcoming uh, immigrants and, and you know, uh, undocumented folks who are coming to the country. What do you need? I mean, one, is there relief now um, in those places? And two, what do you need to see uh, to think that a credible immigration reform package is real? Hmm. That's a great question. I just want to build uh, from some of the stuff that you already said, Janet, which is I really do feel like we only have 16 months to engage in transformative legislative change. And everyone has to be operating with that same level of urgency. Hmm. I think what COVID has brought to light in terms of the disparities, the structural barriers to a just economy, to an equitable healthcare system, all of that, right, has been uh, accelerated, I think, by the pandemic. And we are now in a position not just to tweak along the edges, but to really think about how to transform some of these systems and how to get these right, how to center racial equity in all that the government does. And so I just I think we have to lean into this moment, understanding that things cannot go back to a normal that never served us, that never worked for Latinos, for the black yeah. folks, for low income people in this country. So that's the opportunity. Now, on immigration, I feel like we have a sort of once in a lifetime opportunity to really get this right. And I often remark on the silver lining to the Trump era um, being that it should now be clear to everyone that our system needs a massive overhaul and it can no longer lead with detention and deportation. Right. So there are reforms that need to be addressed as part of an overhaul to our enforcement apparatus. And then there's also relief. Now, I am proud of the work that our movements have done. I think it is because of the movement that President Biden has leaned in in the way that he has on immigration. Mm. It is long, many years of organizing, of building power from the ground up. And we do that with our partners all over the country. And we are committed to legalizing 11 million undocumented immigrants. However, in this moment, it's also critical that Democrats and the Biden administration use all of the power that they have in this moment they have a democratic trifecta, to advance through early breakthroughs on immigration, right? And so that in this moment very concretely means that there are a set of bills that passed the House last year that they can get through the finish line immediately in the House, mm. send them to the Senate. And immediately, it means that as we talk about recovery as a country, that we also legalize essential workers as part of our economic recovery. And if many things are gonna move via reconciliation, certainly we can get this done as well. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not abandoning the long-term shot, but it's certainly moving away from the all or nothing strategy um, that we've utilized in the past. Well, let me let me just ask you both, Lorella and, and, and Janet. Janet, you know, works in a nonpartisan way, you know, across uh, both, uh, both sides of the aisle. You know, what you're saying is very FDR, very LBJ, very rewire the contract, you know, big moment. You've got to have some Republicans on board. Are there some Republicans on board, Janet? You know, I think there are. Look, uh, Steve, we recognize that there was broad bipartisan support for, for those DACA beneficiaries, for those dreamers. 
We also saw in the last Congress approval and passage in both houses for a farm worker modernization bill that was bipartisan. And we've also seen in our data support for in a bipartisan way for help for essential workers. Right. I think obviously we have to explore that and we have to make good faith efforts to build on that bipartisanship. But we also have to learn lessons from before, Steve. And if there are not going to be good faith uh, efforts by Republicans to engage, you know, the clock is ticking. Uh, as right. Lorella pointed out, we don't have time. Uh, we've got to make sure we make every effort to engage in a bipartisan way. We think there is enough consensus to build on and build out relief and protections yeah. for these essential workers who shouldn't have to be worried about their families being separated from them. To the contrary, who should be rewarded for the hard work that they've done. All of these cohorts in some way fit into that essential workforce definition. Right. And so we do believe we have bipartisan basis, but we're not going to wait and we're not going to make the same mistakes that were made in the past. We've got to be able to deliver and show that we have given relief to the country and to those folks who are deserving of investment, resources and protections. That's yeah. powerful. I just wanted to, Lorella, um, please, yeah. to follow up on this, which is when you center people, right? And we get to work with these folks every day. When you center low-income people of color, when you center low-income people in the conversation, the politics become irrelevant, right? So it is actually not about whether we're talking about Republicans or Democrats. It is very much about how are we legislating for, how are we governing for people, how do we center people and their lived experience, their experience of desperation in this moment, of abandonment, of destitution in our policy making and in our, in our policy design? And, and beyond that, how do we take this as an opportunity to both provide relief and reimagine and restructure our government systems, right? right? Our economy, our healthcare system, our immigration enforcement system, our criminal law reform system. That is actually the gift of this moment. That's the silver lining of this moment. Yeah. Out of a lot of pain and a lot of sadness and a lot of hurt in our country, there's some good that can come out of this if we realize that we have this opportunity, as you said, to treat it like FDR did with that level of seriousness and that level of commitment, right? And believe that America can and must do better. Look, I, you know, I just sort of feel like I should make a date with you right now for 16 months from now. Say, did we do it? Did we not do it? So we'll have to do that. I mean, I talk to Janet every month, but you know, maybe we're going to all get together in, in 16 months. But Lorella um, and, and both of you, again, I try to listen to as many of the media and press calls with the, the White House as, as we're invited to. But there's been such a blizzard of executive action, such a blizzard of things. I mean, it's been an incredible 10 days or 11 days, however many days it's been. Um, and I haven't heard ICE mentioned. So I don't know the answer to my question, but there was such a concern about deportations and not just deportations, inhumane deportations, tracking people down through the courts, tracking people down through um, uh, you know, food banks and, and you know, support shelters and whatnot. Is, has that stopped? Or, I mean, you seem to know that world. And has the Biden administration, to your knowledge, done anything explicitly yet to address that part of the federal bureaucracy under their control? Um, ha ha has ICE's behavior been shifted at all? Um, I mean, I'm going to say that we're only right coming out of week one. Yeah, um, no, I know. I mean, but a lot has happened in week one, right? But, but when, when you would hear, but I mean, I don't want to I don't want to argue with you, but I mean, when you would hear the horrific things that were going on, I'm, this is my editorial view. I'm just wondering if they're still going on right now or not, or whether, whether it's you know a, a second tier subject. So I'm not knocking yeah, the well, Biden team; they have done a lot, but it, it's a big deal. I, I, you know, it's a huge deal, and I don't think that the Biden administration is treating it like a second tier issue in this moment. I right? see. They announced as part of their first set of executive actions on day one a moratorium on or a pause on removals across the board. Now, what's happened is. The federal district courts uh, in Texas has an order that they issued on Monday, which temporarily has halted the administration's promise to pause on deportations. That's a huge disappointment for our community, but it's truly just a temporary setback. 
Hmm. And so I believe that, you know, Ali Mayorkas and his team at the Department of Homeland Security are going to have a lot of work to do. You're taking an agency that where many of its workforce, much of its workforce has been not just rewarded, right? Not just encouraged, but has been directed to um, to act with impunity, to act with cruelty, to target every person that they come across who's undocumented. Um, it's just a different shift. It's an entire, you have to move an entire agency to operate very differently in this moment. So I think we've seen early positive, very positive signs. And it's now going to be on them to come through on many of the commitments that they made while they campaigned, right? We have to now see significant cuts to our detention system, right? We have to see closure of detention facilities. They need to do a court docket review to close hundreds of thousands of non-priority cases that continue to contribute to the court backlog. They need to issue broad, um, rather narrow, right? right? But very strong prosecutorial discretion guidelines that protect people from detention and deportation. And they really have to lean in and legalize as many people as possible, right? So is there anything else you would add? The Janet? only point, uh, Steve, just to make this point very clear, we need Secretary-designate Alejandro Mayorkas to be confirmed. Mm. And we saw some politics being played on this by Republicans who wanted to try to filibuster him. Now, obviously, they voted yesterday to move forward with that cloture vote. We need that leadership in place now. Everyone, including all previous Homeland Security secretaries, have endorsed Alejandro Mayorkas. He's had experience. He has the knowledge. We are in crisis in his leadership so we can move forward with these commitments that the Biden administration has made. But that leadership needs to be in place. We are in crisis and the Senate need and the Senate Republicans need to quit playing games on that or partisan politics and approve a, a, a capable and well-qualified uh, nominee immediately. So we hope to see that happen on Monday. You know, you're both you're both wonderful. I love having these discussions. And um, I'm going to ask you, I mean, this could get me in trouble, but, you know, I'm often aware that when we have conversation, we're talking about reset and I've invited both you here. We're going to talk immigration. So, you know, we're going to have someone from Community Change, Lorella Praeli. We're going to have Jenna Mejia from Unidos U.S. We're going to talk about immigration in the Hispanic and Latino community. There's an element of typecasting in that, right? So maybe we should talk about healthcare, broadband, education, you know, going to the moon again. I mean, there are lots of other issues that are out there that, that your communities are also a part of. So I wanna ask you, <clears throat> as we wrap up these conversations today, what are the conversations that we should be inviting you to have with us beyond immigration? Does that make sense? Well, am I, am yes, I saying absolutely. it right way? Am I gonna get in real trouble after this, Janet? <laughs> no, Steve, it's important. And you should know at Unidos U.S., we've been working on many issues. A, a lot of people do typecast us as the only issue we care about. It is an important one is immigration. Yeah. But come on, we're in the midst of the worst pandemic we've had in a century. Right. We care about health care and the disproportionate impact that this pandemic has had on our community and communities of color. But we also understand the economic implications from this pandemic. And so, yes, we needed to be talking about equity as it, it affects vaccine uh, distribution and uptake. We need to be talking about access to testing uh, for healthcare so that mm. we can make sure that we're uh, doing the follow-up that needs to be done. But on the economic side, see, you know, right now, housing uh, and evictions are really important. We need to extend some moratoriums on housing evictions and on student, uh, let, student debt, uh, we also need to be talking about the way our Latino students have been disadvantaged in this remote learning environment because mm. there are inequities in broadband and not everybody has access to those supports. We're gonna be working on this recovery package and looking at all of those issues. And it's important right. to take a comprehensive look at where that disproportionate impact has has affected our community and keeping equity top of mind as we look at this recovery. Cool, Lorella, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you the last word. Yeah, Steve, people do not live single issue lives, Yes, right? There exactly. is a single Latino in this country or a single immigrant in this country or a single low income person in this country 
who only cares about one issue. All of these issues, be it the economy, food and nutrition, education, economic relief, immigration, they touch on people across the board. And so we have to, especially in 2021, be talking about it and engaging in this conversation from that perspective. And at Community Change, we believe, we believe in the fierce dignity of low-income people and their power to transform the laws and the policies and the institutions that govern their lives. And we have a racial justice and an economic justice approach here. And so you cannot talk about immigration without talking about access to healthcare. You cannot talk about economic justice without talking about racial justice. And in this moment, Steve, the conversations that we need to be talking about, how are we not only solving for the emergency, but making sure, right, that we don't ever go back to the way things were pre-pandemic. That in fact, America and Americans deserve a better, a more equitable and a more just future. And we can do that if we get honest about our economy, our healthcare system, our education system, and the disparities that have long played communities of color in this country and low income people, regardless of race, right? R regardless of ethnic background. So, um, so we look forward to being in that conversation with you. Well, I'm really happy we ended with that, with that answer. I'm really happy I asked the question and I didn't kind of step on a landmine. You know, I was, you know, Janet makes me nervous. She's so incredibly wonderful and intimidating. But, <laughs> but Lorella uh, Paele, um, co-president co of the Community Change and, and Community Change Action, I really appreciate your time. And Janet Murhia, President and CEO of Uni Unidos US, thank you for being my anchors today and for letting me, I've just been feeling that it was important to have this question of what are the broad issues we're all you know, struggling with and caring about, get out of our boxes a little bit. A perfect way to end our forum on Reset today. Thank you both so much. Thank you, thank you. Steve. Good to see you. Nice. That brings us to the end of our program. A big thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for this important and timely discussion today. For those of you who missed any of the conversations, we'll have the video up from the event on our website shortly. I'm Steve Clemens, Reset 2021. Be well.